Take your Bible this evening, if you would, please, and go to Job 23, Job 23, right before Psalms, the book of Job, chapter 23 for our scripture reading tonight. We're going to read verses 8 through 12 of Job chapter 23. We'll read 8 together, then I'll read 9, we'll read 10 together, and we'll alternate till we end together reading verse number 12 of Job chapter 23. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. Let's begin together on verse 8 of Job 23. Ready? Behold, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, that I cannot see him. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot hath held his steps. His way have I kept, and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing to the reading of the scripture now here this evening. Uh, Thank you, Lord, already for the wonderful singing tonight. It's been good for our souls to sing praises to you. Lord, thank you for the good spirit that's here in this service tonight. And Lord, we ask you that you would... Uh, help us now to focus and to give our full attention to your word this evening. Lord, I pray that each of us would have ears to hear what you would want to say to each of us this evening. And so, Lord, help us from being distracted. Help us to concentrate and ask you to speak to our heart tonight through your word. And bless the special now as it's given. In Jesus' name, amen. God never moves without purpose or plan When trying his servant and molding a man Give thanks to the Lord, though your testing seems long In darkness he giveth a song Oh, rejoice in the Lord, he makes no mistakes. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. I could not see through the shadows ahead. So I looked at the cross of my Savior instead. I bowed to the will of the Master that day. Then peace came and tears fled away. Oh, rejoice in the Lord. He makes no mistakes. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. Now I can see Testing comes from above. God strengthens his children and purges in love. My Father knows best, and I trust in his care. Through purging, more fruit I will bear. Oh, rejoice in the Lord. He makes no mistakes. He know at the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth, I shall 
come forth. I shall come forth as gold. Amen. <clears throat> now, Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to open up your word together. And, Lord, I'm asking for your help as we bring the truth here this evening and we look carefully at the words of Job and try to glean some, some things that will help us to be able to say along with him that when I am tried, I shall come forth as gold. And so Lord, help us to get the truth across tonight and help each one as they listen. And I pray that each of us would give you our undivided attention for these next few minutes that we look into your word and may you speak to our hearts tonight. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Nobody was more afflicted or tested in the Bible than Job. In fact, he's held up in the book of James as an example of someone who endured uh, with much patience uh, suffering. And mo many of the times when you may be going through a, a tough patch, uh, you may remind yourself, well, I probably don't have it as hard as what Job did. And we, we hold him up as what he went through. Maybe the closest New, Tes New Testament parallel, as a matter of fact, might be the Apostle Paul, who he lists in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 all the things that he went through from shipwreck and uh, being beaten uh, with 39 stripes uh, several times and being left in the deep for a night and a day and all the things that he went through. Uh, but yet when it came down to the end of Paul's life, when he's ready to be beheaded, he writes the words, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, and I have kept the faith. Well, I'd like to say that at the end of my life, wouldn't you? And uh, that's a good epitaph to have. And uh, that's what Paul was able to say. He was able to do that. And, and, and I think Job was able to say, I'll come forth as gold. Now, we understand something. To get there, we have to go through some trials. To get there, we're going to have to go through some difficulties. We're going to have to go through some troubles. It may be in your personal life. It may be financially. It may be in your marriage. It may be in your health. It may be in your friendships. And there's times you might feel like Job. If your Bible's open to Job 23, Job said this as he's going through his trial. He said, Behold, I go forward, verse 8, but he's not there. And backward but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him, he hideth himself. On the right hand that I cannot see him. You ever felt that way when you're going through a hard time and a difficult trial? And it seems like I can't find God? God isn't, uh, God's unaware of what's going on in my life? It seems like He hides Himself from you? And, and you can't find Him? How do you get through a time like that? How do you get past things like that and, and be able to say like Job, and he said in verse number 10, He knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. How, how do you get to where you can say that? How do you get to where you can say with Paul, I fought a good fight, I finished my course, and I've kept the faith? When I go through the difficulties of life, and everybody's going to go through them. When you go through the testings of life and everyone's going to be tested. When you go through some difficulties, some tragedies, and everyone's going to go through them. How do I come forth as gold? I want to give you three principles to follow that I think Job gives us here in Job 23 to help us to come forth as gold when we go through the trials. Number one is this. Determine the trial will make you better. Before it ever comes, before you ever go through the trial, make the determination that it will make you better and not bitter. Job said, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. He didn't say, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as a, as a nervous wreck. He didn't say, for when he hath tried me, I'll come forth in bitterness. Or when he hath tried me, I'll come forth with my faith shaken. He didn't say that. 
He said, I shall come forth as gold. He didn't say, I'll try to come forth as gold. I hope to come forth as gold. He said, I shall come forth as gold. That sounds like he's pretty determined to me. That he set that in stone that he will come forth as gold. You listen, no trial, no testing, no tragedy, no difficult can ruin you can ruin you unless you allow it to ruin you. You have to let it ruin you. And greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. Lee Robertson, the great pastor of the Highland Park Baptist Church, who's in heaven now, when he was just a young man, a young pastor, away preaching a meeting, got word to uh, come home, and by the time he got home, he found out his two-year-old little girl had died, and he had to have a funeral to bury her. But they took what little money they had left at that time as just a young couple, and they bought a campground called Camp Joy. And through the years, they allowed young people to come there for no charge to hear about Jesus Christ. And thousands upon thousands of young people over 40 years heard the story of Jesus and received Him as their Savior. I'd say He came forth as gold through the trial. Most of you know Fanny Crosby and the hymns that she wrote in our hymn book blinded by the mistake of a doctor at just six months of age. But she, she didn't let that <clears throat> defeat her. She didn't let that make her bitter. She allowed it to make her better. And she took that as God's will for her life. And she, she later in life said, I thank God that I was blinded. Because she realized I probably never would have written the songs I've written had I been able to see. And she said, the truth is, I'm glad I'm blind because the first face I'll ever see will be the face of my Savior, Jesus Christ. The song that Tanya sang tonight was written by Ron Hamilton, who is Patch the Pirate. And, and that whole ministry wouldn't have been possible. That song was written when he went into the doctor and went into surgery actually at Emory University near Atlanta with a tumor in his eye and did not know, he said, that you will, we will not know whether we're able to save the eye till we come out of surgery. You'll either have the eye and you'll be able to continue to see or you'll be, we'll have to take the eye out to get the tumor out. And of course, he lost his eye when they took the tumor. And he went to church not long after that with the patch over his eye and a little kid came up and said, you remind me of a pirate. He said, I guess I am, and didn't know what his name was, and he said, I guess I'm Patch the Pirate. And that's started a ministry that I think now for over 40 years has ministered to, to thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of children. Ron Hamilton has come forth as gold. Most of you are familiar with the name Lisa Beamer. Her husband, Todd Beamer, <clears throat> was on the Flight 93 on 9-11, 2001. She, <clears throat> what you don't know, she may not know, she was reared in a very loving home where the Lord was honored, grew up in a Christian home. And she said this, on October 25th, 1984, pain seared through my father's chest and everyone thought he was having a heart attack. The next morning at 5 a.m., the doctor called mom to tell her that dad had suffered an aortic aneurysm. A small hole had developed in the wall of his aorta, and it had to be repaired immediately. Mom explained to Paul, Holly, and me that the hospital had called and the doctors were going to do emergency surgery. They're going to move daddy to another hospital, she said. We need to pray. At 6.30 that morning, we were in the process of praying when the phone rang again and mom left the room to answer it. When she came back, she blurted through the tears. They tried to move dad, but it was too late. He died. In that instant, my world fell apart. I wasn't ready for this. I was 15. I felt cheated. Dad was our foundation. The rock we all depended on. Now he's been ripped out of our lives. In Lisa's description <clears throat> of her struggle with her father's sudden death, 
I think you see a preview of what was coming on September 11th. She said this, My faith in God was severely shaken. Questions pummeled my heart and mind. She went from wonderful and a wonderful life to a sense of great vulnerability. She said, we had our faith in God and we believed solidly that God had everything under His control, but the hole in our family was real. She had faith in God, but the hole in her family was real. She said, despite our faith, sometimes life just hurts. She recalls the promise that God made to the prophet Jeremiah to his people, that I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. She went to talk with a man named Dennis Macero, who was the director of Christian outreach at a local college that she was near to. The subject of the upcoming trial for a malpractice suit came up. And so she immediately told her story of her father's death to Dennis Macero. Dennis looked at her and said, You know, Lisa, God knew that the hospital you took your dad to wasn't going to have the right equipment to perform the surgery. At any time, God could have changed the circumstances. He said, knowing the consequences, what the consequences are going to be for your family and for you, He nonetheless allowed it to happen. Maybe it's time for you to accept that. She said, His gentle words were a targeted arrow into my heart. I knew He was right. At the same time, I both loved and hated Him for telling me the truth. But the truth set me free. A thought struck me. Lisa, who are you to question God and say that you have a better plan than He does? You don't have the same wisdom or knowledge that He does. You don't have the understanding of the big picture as He does. You think you deserve a happy life and get angry when it doesn't always happen like that. When the fact is you're a sinner who is deserving of death and hell. All at once, I was caught in a dichotomy. I know I'm really important to God and I know He loves me, but at the same time, I'm human and I have a limited understanding. Who am I to question Him? And she made this statement. Listen carefully. She said, It was then I made a conscious decision to stop questioning God and start trusting That brief conversation she had with Dennis Massaro would become one of the most significant in my life, she said. I replayed it in my mind over and over again in the years to come. And so the loss of a 15-year-old's father and the struggles of a young collegian to show how a loving Heavenly Father was preparing a woman to face an even greater challenge would come to pass on September 11, 2001 when her husband Todd was one of the heroes on Flight 93 with the famous Let's Roll and they attacked the terrorists on the plane. You see, fire burns off the dross of the gold. It purifies the gold. And in similar ways, the trials we go through as believers, it burns the impurities out of our life. And what remains and what God is looking for is the character of Jesus Christ to come. That we would, we would get rid of the impurities and we would allow that heat to, to, for God to be able to wipe those away so we can come forth as gold. You have to be determined Determine ahead of time, I will be better by the trial, not bitter. I shall come forth as gold. Not I'll try, not I'll do my best, not I hope to, I shall come forth 
as gold. The second thing we do, the second principle to come forth as gold is decide that you'll continue to do what's right. Notice again chapter 23. Job said this in verse 11. Did you notice it when we read it? My foot hath held his steps. His way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. Job said, my foot held his way, as his, my, his way have I kept, I have not declined. I don't see God. Remember what he said? I don't see God. I don't know where he is. I looked on the left, he's not there. I looked on the right, I can't find him. I don't know what's going on. I don't know why this is all taking place. And he's got friends who are accusing him of all kinds of things thinking they've got the answer. And Job says, uh, what did you do, Job? Job says, I did exactly what I was supposed to do. I continued in the ways of God. I continued in what I was supposed to do. I'm not going back. What did he do? He kept on praying. He just kept on uh, reading the Word of God. He kept on being faithful. He kept on coming to church. He kept on singing in the choir. He kept on ushering. He kept on being kind. He kept on helping others. You see, the temptation that comes to us when we face trials, when we go through our times, you know what temptation is? To drop everything. Just, oh no, i got, I, I got to quit Sunday school. i got to quit the choir. i got to quit doing this. I, I, I can't come to church tonight. It's, i I got too much on my mind. And the tendency is always to withdraw and to isolate. And Job says, no, if you want to come forth as gold, don't decline from His ways. Just continue to uh, hold His steps. His way have I kept and not declined. I've not gone back from His commandments. I go ahead and I do what I ought to do. When obedience is most difficult, it is most necessary. You have to continue to obedient to God. And listen, everything in your flesh, everything in your soul is going to scream to you, you can't do that. But that's exactly what you need to do. You need to not follow your soul. You need to follow what God says. And listen to the leading of the Spirit and not the leading of your soul. I'm not sure that Paul and Silas, as they were in stocks having been beaten and were put in the inner prison, and at midnight, I'd not, I'm not sure if they followed their soul, what they felt, what they, what they, what they uh, thought, and what they, they wanted to do. I don't think they felt like singing praises to God. But they knew that was what they ought to do. That's what they should do. They were praying and singing praises to God. And, and guess what happened? The jailer got saved. And his family got saved. Why? Because somebody went through a trial and they weren't in the prison saying, God, where are you? Paul could have said, hey, I had the vision and the guy said, come over and help us. Is this what you call helping us? I thought this would be revival, man. What is this about? There was no complaining. There was no, no uh, uh, questioning of God. They were praising Him. Why? Because God says we ought to be continually praising Him. Good? Praise Him. If it's not so good, praise Him. You feel like it, praise Him. If you don't feel like it, praise Him. And continue to do what God tells you to do. You have an argument at home? Come to church anyway. Stay in the book. Bad day at work? Come to church anyway. Stay in the book. Lost your job? Loved one passes away? Bad news from the doctor? Do not isolate yourself from what you know you ought to do. Don't decline from the commandments of God. You've got to decide, I'm going to do right no matter what. I'm going to do what God says regardless how I feel. I can't be led by my feelings. Boy, it's real quiet in here, Bob. You notice that? I feel like I'm a voice crying in the wilderness. Now, I can do that. By the way, 
you can do that because you're believing his promise. What's his promise? I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. God never said you're going to have it easy. He never said it's just going to be a smooth path all the way through. He said, no, but when you go through the waters or you go through the fire, you know what he said? I will be with you. I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. How can I keep going to church? How can I keep reading His Word? How can I keep on praying for others and trying to help others and trying to witness to others and tell others about Christ when I don't feel it even in my own heart and I'm not even sure where God is. I continue to do what I ought to do because I know, according to this book, He is with me. And I have to keep obeying Him. We, <clears throat> one of the men at RU the other night was saying that we, we talked about the importance of discipline. Some of them have not done, had not done any challenges. And, and there's, uh, we have a saying at RU that, that I tell these guys quite often, I think I've told it to you before here, I say, if Quentin doesn't have any challenges, I say, Quentin, you either make the effort or you make the excuses. You've heard that from me before, haven't you? Say, yeah? Said, now, now what's it going to be? What type of guy are you? You're going to make excuses or you're going to make the effort? Now, if I'm going to make the effort, one, one, one fellow was honest. He said, I haven't looked at this for two weeks. Well, I appreciate your honesty, but you know why you haven't looked at it for two weeks? Because you haven't scheduled a time to look at it for two weeks. What you don't schedule time for, you will not do. If it's important, you'll schedule a time. Because that's important to you. How many of you go to work tomorrow morning? Let me see your hand. How many of you go to work tomorrow morning? Okay. Oh, it's Labor Day. That's right. <laughs> How about Tuesday? Will you go to work Tuesday? There's more people going to work tomorrow. Brother Dave, what time do you have to be there? 7 o'clock. Xavier, you work Tuesday? What time do you have to be there? Eight o'clock. They don't. They didn't just tell you guys, "Hey, when you feel like coming in, if you can make it in, we'd like to see you here Tuesday sometime." No, you have a definite time to be there, and probably a definite time to clock out. Because they kind of feel like what we're doing here is pretty important, and we need you here for a set amount of hours to accomplish what ought to get done. Because it's important. And so when things are important, we schedule it and we say we're going to do it. I've done that before with people when they say, now I want you to come to church on Sunday. And they say, well, I'll try. I, I've done that many times. I say, well, let me ask you this. Uh, do you work on Monday? And it wasn't Labor Day. And, uh, and they say, yeah. I say, are you going to work tomorrow? Yeah, I sure am. I said, oh, you mean you're not going to try? How can you commit to say, yeah, definitely I'm going to work tomorrow, but you won't commit definitely to be in church on Sunday? You see, what's important to you? And so you've got to set a time. I told that fellow, you've got to set a time. Sometime during the week, you set a time, say, at this time, I'm going to get my RU book out, I'm going to open it up, and I'm going to work on my challenges. I'm going to take a half hour, and I'm going to work on them. If you don't do that, Friday will come around again, and there you'll be, just where you were before. You have, to, you have to, discipline doesn't make you spiritual, but it makes spirituality available to you. You have to have the discipline to get out of bed and read your Bible. You have to have discipline to sit down or get on your knees or get beside your bed or sit in your chair and pray. If you don't have discipline to do that, then you never pray. So you, you, you have to continue to do what you know God told, tells you to do. When Joseph was cast into prison, there's a, there's a line in Genesis, but the Lord was with Joseph. When Joshua faced the obstacles there in the land of Jericho, it says the Lord was with Joshua. When David was being chased by Saul, it says, but the Lord was with David. So every time as they went through the trial, they, they were aware, I'll keep doing what I know I ought to do. Why? Because I know the Lord is with me. 
I won't go by what my feelings, I won't go by what I feel or what I think. I'll go by what I know God's Word says. And it says, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. We have to have a determination that we'll be better by the trial, not bitter. We have to make a decision that we're going to continue to do what God tells us to do, continue to do right. And the third thing we do to come forth as gold is we desire to meditate on God's Word. Desire to meditate on God's Word. Look at verse 12 of Job 23. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of His lips. I have esteemed the words of His mouth more than my necessary food. That's an amazing statement. Well, you ought to treat the Bible just as you treat your necessary food. And that's good, but that's not what he said. He said, I esteem the words of my mouth more than my necessary food. Wow. That's tough for Americans to swallow. No pun intended. Most of us have a set time to eat. Whether it's breakfast or when you go to work, you say, okay, your lunch hour is from this time to this time. And you know what happens? Whether we're hungry or not, we eat. Why? It's time. So we'll pull out of the, the sack lunch or whatever it is we have, and we eat. Because it's time to eat. Do you set time to read your Bible? And then read it whether you feel like it or not? You'll never read the Bible every day until you read the Bible on the days you don't feel like reading the Bible. Do you believe the Bible is alive? It, God said it was. Do you believe the Bible can transform a life? Believe it can change you? I know that eating will change you. Someone said, I thought the dryer was shrinking my clothes. Then I found out it was the refrigerator. <laughs> That's true. Eating changes you, but so does spiritual nourishment. You just give yourself... I tell people all the time, you, you want to change? Listen, you, you make time to read your Bible every single day. Give 30 minutes to reading the Bible... Be in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Do that for six solid weeks and see if your life hasn't changed. It'll change. Because God's Word is powerful. It's, it's, it's sad how anemic Christians are in their knowledge of the Bible. Some people live in fear, and there's some in this room... You live in fear of anybody entering you, and you entering into anybody with a, for a Bible conversation because you're embarrassed of your Bible knowledge. I expect when I take my car into the mechanic that the mechanic knows something about cars. And I certainly expect if I go to a lawyer that that fellow knows something about the law. And I certainly expect the doctor to know something about medicine when I go to see him. I expect my insurance agent to know something about insurance. And if you have investments, you expect that broker to know something about investing. Is it too much to think that a Christian ought to know something about the Bible? We know that we read the Bible, and, and that's, that's what most preachers spend their time just trying to get people to do, is just read it. But the Bible says we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God. Why do you read the Bible? So you'll find some things. Brother Dean was sharing some things this morning, and uh, Brother Yoda showed us a verse that, that God had uh, kind of jumped out at him when he was reading the Word this week. And, and you know what it does? It, it prompts you then to want to study that a little bit. And where else is that found? And reading ought to lead to studying the Bible. 
Man, if we talked about just being faithful to read the Bible, most Christians get convicted. But when we talk about studying the Bible, how many believers take time to study the Bible? Well, why do we study the Bible? So we can memorize the Bible. Why do we want to memorize the Bible? So we can meditate on the Bible. Meditate. Meditation. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. You meditate in your heart. All you do, all you do when you memorize is you store it in your head. This up here, that's where you store information. The Lord didn't say out of the abundance of the mind the mouth speaks. He said out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. So when I talk, it's something has come, I've had something that has brought it from my head down into my heart and it comes out my mouth. What brings the Word of God from your head down to your heart so you can bring it out your mouth is meditation. Thinking on it. Meditating on it. Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. That thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written therein. You know why? Because thinking determines living. You've got to think on it and meditate on it and you will observe to do it. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. Man, if we said, how many of you want prosperity and how many of you want success? Well, sure. Then why don't we meditate on God's Word? Why don't we read and study and memorize and meditate on God's Word? Well, preacher, I just don't have time to do all that. There's other people in this room have the same 168 hours in a week you do. They find time to do it. You know what I found out years ago? I find time to do the things I really want to do. And the things that I don't want to do, I find an excuse. Psalm 1, 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. There it is again. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Whatsoever you do will prosper. Wow. Such tremendous promises. For meditating, for meditating Christians. Many Christians fail because we meditate on the wrong things. You have to desire to meditate on God's Word. Look with me at Romans chapter 8, would you please? Are you doing alright? You want me to go back to unspeakable words and unspeakable? Romans 8. Notice with me verse number 5. The Bible says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Now, listen, let me, let me remind you what the flesh is. The flesh is when you're being led by your soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Okay, When that leads your body, your body leads to your soul, and you're being led by your soul, you're doing what you think, what you feel, and you want. That's being, that's being after the flesh. When you're after the Spirit, you're listening to God's Spirit with your spirit, and your heart is turned to your spirit who's obeying God's Spirit, so you'll do what God says, what God thinks, and what God wants. No matter how you feel. No matter what you think. No matter what you want. So they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind, if you're going to be after the flesh, you're going to be thinking about fleshly things, is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, 
neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot do what? Please God. Do you remember why we're here? To please God. And if I'm after the flesh, or I'm allowing my soul to lead my body, and I'm thinking on those things, I'm not pleasing to God. I'm not fulfilling the purpose for which I'm even created. I'm not fulfilling the purpose for why I'm here. You cannot be a spiritual person and dwell on carnal things. Impossible. Stanford University research revealed that what we watch has an effect on our imaginations, our learning patterns, and our behaviors. Their study showed that first we're exposed to new behaviors and characters. Next, we learn to acquire these new behaviors. And the last and most critical step is we adopt these behaviors as our own. One of the most critical aspects of human development that we need to understand is the influence of repeated viewing and repeated verbalizing in shaping our future. The information goes in harmlessly, almost unnoticed on a daily basis, but we don't react to it until later when we aren't able to realize the basis for our actions. In other words, they said our value system is being formed without any conscious awareness on our part of what's happening. They concluded, you are what you watch and think. They said if a 60-second commercial by repeated viewing can sell us a product, isn't it possible that a 30 to 60-minute program by repeated viewing can sell us a lifestyle? If Christians are going to succeed, you have to set your mind, you have to set your meditator on things above, not on things on the earth. That's the only, the, that's why the Bible says set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Or we'll never, ever put off the old man and put on the new. How do I come forth as gold? I have to determine, I have to decide, and I have to have a desire. Determine I'm going to be better by this trial, not bitter. I'm going to decide to continue to do what I know God tells me to do, regardless of how I think, feel, or want. And I'm going to desire to meditate in God's Word. Grab some verses from the Bible, write them on cards, carry them with you, pull them out, pull them out for 30-second commercials about 100 times a day. You'd be amazed what you'll think about. You'd be amazed what will come into your mind for you to think about. He knoweth the path that I take. And when I'm tried, I'll come forth as gold. I like the story of the Olympic marathon of 1968 in Mexico City. It was 7 o'clock and it was beginning to get dark and the last of the marathon runners were being assisted to first aid stations. Over an hour earlier, Mamo Waldi of Ethiopia had come across the finish line, winning the 26 plus mile race, looking as strong as when he started. As the last few hundred spectators were preparing to leave, they heard police sirens and whistles through the gate entering the stadium. The attention all turned to the gate and a solitary figure wearing the colors of Tan Tanzania came limping into the stadium. His name was John Aquari. He's the last man to finish the marathon in 1968. His left leg was bandaged and bloody. He had taken a bad fall earlier in the race. It was all he could do as they come in and take that final lap around the track to limp around the track. The crowd stood and applauded as he completed the last lap. When he finally crossed the finish line, one reporter asked the question everyone was wondering, you're badly injured, 
Your leg is bloody and bandaged. Why didn't you just give up? And a quarry said with quiet dignity, My country did not send me 7,000 miles to start the race. My country sent me here to finish the race. Can I affirm to you that's what God has sent you and me to do? He didn't save you just to start the race. He saved you to finish the race. And that's where the gold comes in. It's not finishing first. It's not a competition among other runners. It's finishing the race. And finishing well, as the Apostle Paul said. And so often, if you've been saved any length of time, you realize there are many that drop out of the race and they don't finish. They don't finish well. How many Christians have you known since you first came to Christ are still faithfully walking with the Lord? Those who finish the race will come forth as gold. Oswald Chambers said this, every humiliation, everything that tries and vexes us is God's way of cutting a deeper channel in us through which the life of Christ can flow through us. The Lord's grand design for our lives is not to measure us for greater levels of success, but rather mold us into a greater likeness of His Son. That's God's plan. To make us more like Christ. Come forth as gold. Determine the trial will make you better. Decide to continue to do right. Desire to meditate on the Word of God. And say with Job, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for Job. Thank you for the truth that you had him pen here and Job 23, thank you for the Apostle Paul who said, I fought a good fight, I've finished my course, and I've kept the faith. And Lord, I do not know personally anyone in the room right now that is necessarily going through a trial. I just know in this thing called life, we always seem to be in a trial or coming out of a trial or heading into a trial. We all have struggles. We all have difficulties. But Lord, we desire to come forth as gold. We desire that Christ be formed in our life. And that we fulfill the purpose for which You saved us. We're to bring pleasure to You. And Lord, I pray that You've taken the truth tonight. The Spirit of God has brought it home to the hearts of those who are going through a tough time. That tonight there'll be a determination made. I will come forth as gold. I will continue to do as God tells me to do. I will not decline from His commandments or walking in the way I know I should. And I will meditate on God's Word.